All right. Back over to you, Bill. Okay. Well, tonight it is my great pleasure to introduce Deepshika. She's an undergraduate, a senior. I guess we don't need to say rising senior anymore because things are rolling now. Um, in the current academic year. She's an undergraduate student in the Management Entrepreneurship and Technology Program in the College of Engineering and the Haas School of Business. So without further ado, Deepshika, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, let me go ahead and share my slides. Okay, so I hope oops, everyone can see my screen. Um, well, hello everyone. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about my journey into cloud computing, my experience with it outside of the classroom. And to make this really interesting for you all and to kind of grab your attention, I want to dive right into a case study of Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud and how it was used at Lyft Level 5 to save them a ton of money. So. Before we get started, let me introduce myself. My name is Deepshika, and I'm currently a senior at UC Berkeley studying electrical engineering, computer science, and business. Currently, I'm working with Bill, one of the organizers of this meetup on uh, innovation initiatives for the university. And through some of my past internships, I've dealt with a couple different aspects of cloud computing, usually via Amazon Web Services. So Amazon Web Services provide so many different options for customization on the cloud, but having so many different options often makes it very hard to determine which options are the best to fit your specific business needs. So to provide some guidance in this aspect, I want to walk through a case study from my internship this past summer at Lyft Level 5. Before diving into how AWS is used at Lyft, I want to provide some context about Level 5 as a whole. So you all probably have heard of Lyft as a company focused on providing on-demand shared rides for individuals that can be requested right through an app on your phone. To supplement this goal, Lyft recently launched an autonomous vehicles division in 2017 to develop in-house self-driving technology that could potentially offer for shared rides in the future. So theoretically, as if a user requests a ride, it could be from a human driver or through one of these autonomous, autonomously driven cars. However, self-driving technology is not only extremely difficult technically, it is a very open-ended, unsolved problem that needs a lot more exploration. It's also very data intensive. So the cars themselves are equipped with over 30 different sensors that are continually collecting data on every single test drive for every millisecond. On top of the real-time data that the technology inside the car needs to process to make decisions, it's also equipped with many pre-trained models and maps that the technology uses to you know, make decisions and per perceive different things in its environment. So because Lyft engineers are constantly working with such large data sets to build these different models and maps, it's super computationally and financially expensive to test the technology each time physically in the car. Instead, engineers developed an in-house internal simulation engine to run virtual test drives. So this helps them a lot with continuous integration and deployment without having to actually take the car out for a test drive. So this simulation engine is built as a microservice using Amazon Web Services EC2, or Elastic Compute Cloud. However, while these simulations are significantly less expensive than test driving the autonomous car each time a pull request is merged to the code base, it's still very expensive to run a simulation because the total data process per week with all of these simulations being run was on the level of petabytes. Therefore, Lyft needed to be very, very careful about which EC2 instances it was actually using for the simulation engine in order to save money. Because of a lot of aspects with COVID, Lyft's leadership was pretty low for the past couple of months. So they were trying to look at ways to reduce some of their costs around their engineering teams. And so it took some time earlier um, this year to reevaluate its current EC2 configuration which originally only used on-demand instances. After careful 
testing, Lyft decided on switching to using spot instances to power its simulation engine. So let's walk through why and how this transition was made from on-demand to spot instances. The compute needs of level five were very different than its parent rideshare organization. So from Lyft's perspective, it wanted to kind of tailor the EC2 um, options to fit its specific needs. Where the rideshare uh, team had consistent demand throughout the day because customers and drivers were consistently using the app to schedule and pick up you know, riders, the level five simulation engine, on the other hand, was only run when there was a significant change that needed to be tested. And these simulations were kind of scheduled ahead of time. The engine itself needed to service large batch style workloads that had very spiky profiles, similar to the image shown on the slide here. So this meant that EC2 instances were, would often be idle and they would need to burst up to high peak loads uh, when they were being used to actually run the simulation. So this prompted Lyft to think about, you know, how, what other instances can we actually use to avoid having this idle downtime for these on-demand instances? So they decided to switch to spot instances, which are a lot less expensive. However, there were a few problems with using the spot instances and switching over to them immediately. So spot instances, um, as, a, as a brief overview for those who may not know, spot instances are basically unused on-demand instances. So they're a lot cheaper than the on-demand uh, instances, which you can guarantee that they'll be available. So with spot instances, the main issue was you could not guarantee that there would be any available at the time that you're requesting them. And even if there were instances available, it might not be the type of instance that's optimized for your specific use case. So it might be a different hardware than what you're used to running. So to make sure that productivity and functionality would still remain uh, top notch and not inconvenience any engineers after switching to spot instances, level five had to make two major engineering changes. First, they started using Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service, or EKS, more carefully to help them identify clusters that operated the most efficiently based on the regional zone usage. So they monitored the behavior of EKS over time, and this helped them allocate work and schedule simulation jobs so that they could kind of guarantee at a high probability that instances would be available at that time. Secondly, they redesigned the simulation engine so that the stack would work on whichever type of instance was available. And we call this fleet diversity. This gave engineers the flexibility to avoid having to actually wait to schedule simulations when the specific instance they wanted wasn't available. So it gave engineers a lot more flexibility and it didn't really affect their workflow to switch from on-demand instances to spot instances because it was all handled with these two engineering changes. Because of the actual unreliability of spot instances, there would definitely be times when, regardless of what precautions we took, there might just not be any spot instances available. So because of this, engineers still had the option of uh, manually overriding the existing infrastructure to use on-demand instances for extremely urgent needs. However, by the end of the transition transitional period, 77% of all of Level 5's engineering workload were, and 90% of their AV simulation engine workload was transferred to spot instances. So this meant that simulations would cost less than 20 cents per execution, resulting in an overall cost savings of two thirds when compared to the original cost when they were only using on-demand instances. On top of this, the engineering changes made resulted in a much more flexible stack that truly optimized its cloud computing usage and molded the existing options to actually fit biz, uh, Lyft's business needs as close as possible. So this case study is not just an example of how to properly configure your AWS services to make the most out of them, but also a tale of how customization of AWS services must often go beyond the configuration of the service itself, but it also needs to be reflected in the engineering of the application. It's not just about your AWS settings, but about the synergy between your engineering stack and the cloud that it's being deployed on. 
So thank you for listening. Um, my contact information is here and I'm happy to take any questions now. Deepshika, I'm wondering if you can tell me a bit about the considerations uh, when using those kind of spot uh, instances that you spin up. Um, and it, that's a massive amount of data. Like how much, um, how do you stage the data to have it be in the spot instance? And does that have to be constantly there? Or you bring the compute to the data or the data to the compute? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a great question. Um, so because we are working with large amounts of data for every single simulation, this was actually handled by another service um, also provided by AWS called Amazon Direct Connect. So the data is originally uploaded to Amazon data stores and um, through their connection with DynamoDB. And so all of this data is then streamed directly to the instance that you're connected to via Amazon Direct Connect. So all of that is kind of handled via like the internal AWS like data pipelines. So we don't need to worry like on the engineers and uh, they don't need to worry about how is the data actually getting to the spot instance or uh, you know, having a lot of lay time to actually load up the data. Also, if folks would rather ask a question on chat, feel free to use that and we will read them out for you. Hi, this is Chris Hoffman. I have a question. Um, really exciting. Great, great job. Um, speaking of jobs, did they then just like basically offer you a job? <laughs> um, yeah, so hi, Chris. It's nice to meet you. Uh, yeah, so I just ended my internship uh, a few weeks ago. And so they're still figuring out hiring um, needs and stuff. So I think they'll get back to me soon about whether I will get a full time offer or not. <laughs> so I know there are a few terms that uh, maybe people aren't as familiar familiar with um, within AWS. So I do have a few slides um, in the appendix and um, I'm sure Bill will post the deck afterwards. So if you had any questions about any of the terms that I mentioned, they are mostly defined um, in the appendix slides. So feel free to check those out. Um, but if there are any other questions, I'm, I'm definitely open to answering them now or you can definitely contact me. Um, my email is on the slide. So I'm happy to answer any questions or talk about talk more about my experience. Yeah, I had a question about um, the fleet diversity. Mm -hmm. um, so was that uh, that the developers um, had to do something with um, generalizing the code implementation? Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there are a couple different types of like instances that were available. So um, if we go here, so there's a, you can optimize the instances for different purposes. So there's like a general purpose one, uh, optimize it for compute, memory, storage, and so on. So each of these kind of have different hardware specifications. And typically at Lyft, when they were using on-demand instances, they were using the compute optimized and the accelerated computing optimized. So they weren't too worried about whether their code would like take too long to execute or things like that because a lot of it would be handled by the hardware itself. So they had to kind of re-engineer their code base so that no matter which one of these instance types was available, it would still work efficiently on them. It looks like we have a question in the chat. Do you have a system design of the architecture you can share? I don't have a system design of the architecture. Um, I don't think that it's publicly available yet, so I can't um, show it. But the general idea here was they kind of had to work with, there were some existing Amazon um, options that you could use to kind of configure, like for example, with the EKS. Um, you could, there were some existing options to 
kind of customize it so that it would kind of learn over time and figure out, okay, like this cluster and this legion, it, you know, has a lot of spot instances available. So we can schedule a lot of simulation jobs there. But some of it was also engineered um, with the like in-house with the stack itself. So it was kind of a collaboration with AWS as well. And another question in the chat, were you able to have access to AWS support resources or did you find you were on your own looking up online resources? Yeah, definitely. So this was a larger undertaking within the entire org. So it definitely wasn't just me working on this. Um, there, we did have access to a lot of AWS support. I think Lyft has been pretty involved with AWS since um, it first transitioned. It uses a lot of its different uh, services. So they were, the support was pretty helpful. I didn't interact with many of them directly um, because my portion of the project wasn't uh, tied uh, directly to this, but they were pretty helpful. I think they were they they were able to help in some aspects, but also you did we did have to do a lot of the engineering ourselves. Um, one more question. So, I imagine that the the amount of data that's being generated in the car is pretty huge. So, how do you go about getting that data um, into your sort of the test suite that you're going to run? And when and I assume it. it that you're doing uh, like acceptance testing or when you make a new change, you're doing these tests. So how often is it like, I imagine the car is changing too. So how volatile is that test data set and how do you manage the, f the velocity and the volume of data that you're dealing with? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, with each test drive that happens, um, all the data is kind of collected on a hard drive in the car. So as soon as a test drive finishes, there is like a data ingest protocol that the hard drive kind of goes through. And this is like an entire team at level five that kind of handles this ingest procedure. And basically they take the test drive data and they kind of parse through it and they figure out, you know, which data is necessary, what is what can be kind of thrown away? How can we store it in an optimized way? They just don't want to store all of the raw data just on its own. They want to make sure that it's um, going to be useful in the future and that it's a test drive that um, will like provide some insights in the future. So that's like one part of it is the ingest is kind of designed in a way so that it's efficient and it's only keeping the information that's absolutely needed. Um, in terms of like outdated data, uh, a lot of the times sensor, the sensors on the car will go through recalibration procedures. And when they're recalibrated, a lot of the past sensor data um, is now kind of uh, obsolete. So a lot of that consistently the data will be like cleaned out. So even though they are going through large amounts of data each week, a lot of the times this data isn't in the data store for a very long time. The data has a very high turnover rate. Um, so it's kind of both good and bad because it's good because you are constantly working with like new data. So your models are, are being trained with like fresh data and like the latest versions from the car. Um, but it's also bad because it, you, the data is being like accessed like very often to be replaced. So it can be kind of lead to performance issues. Thank you. See what kind of soft skills would you say are the most important for getting um, an internship in the companies that you've worked for? Is everyone just super smart or do you see different personality types is a question in the chat. Yeah, great question. Uh, I actually found that a lot of the software engineers that I met at Lyft had a lot of other skills outside of just being like good engineers. Like they were all like very well rounded. I could have conversations with them about engineering topics and, and technology as a whole. But we also could talk about current events, like politics, things like that. So it was definitely a really well-rounded experience. Um, I think one of the, the things that they tried to emphasize but maybe doesn't you know, play out with all the engineers is they like 
it's it's important i think to be able to communicate um, your project effectively, right? When you're an engineer and you're working on a very technical project um, and you're presenting maybe to leadership or your manager or your manager's manager about like what you did for the past couple of months, if you dive like super deep into the technical details, it, it's really hard for them to kind of get to understand exactly what you are talking about um, and they may not understand like the full impact of maybe the work that you did, even if it was like pretty tricky and difficult. So I think one of the things they emphasized a lot for the interns at least was to um, to think a lot about your presentations and the way you're delivering them so that you kind of have you're telling a story um, and you have kind of an introduction, you have the problem statement and then what you did to specifically address the problem statement, as well as what you know, maybe you went long and like what you could learn from that experience as well. Yeah, I thought um, you did a fabulous job um, at um, translating the jargon into digestible information. I was very impressed. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, I was um, trying to strike a good balance between not repeating information that you guys might already know um, and and you know still being able to explain the case study. Yeah, it's very it hard well. <laughs> on to the rabbit holes of uh, technical jargon. Yeah. All right. Oh, wait, are there? No. Oh, I was just going to ask. Are there? Is there anything else in the chat? But it looks like we're good. We're good. Thank you very much, Deepshika. Cool.